All right. Uh, Professor Smalls, welcome. Thank you, sir. I never knew TV, right? <laughs> I appreciate you being here. Um, I wanted to start uh, talking about your experience growing up on a plantation in South Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, your family was dealing with chicken production. Right. Can you tell me about that experience, please? Well, well the plantation um, where I grew up, it was called Arcadia. Um, it's on the Waccamaw River, just north of Georgetown, South Carolina, um, south of Myrtle Beach. And it was primarily a rice plantation during the, you know, the, the 15, 16, 1700 stuff until those days. And rice still grow wild down there. So there's a lot of hunting during the season because the birds all come there to feed. But when I was growing up, it was a poultry plantation. They raised thousands and thousands of turkeys and chicken and they were butcher houses and they were these, the, we, as kids, we would help herd all the, the birds down to the slaughterhouses and the cages and they would be slaughtered and one day you would send thousands and thousands of crates of frozen chickens. You know, they'd get slaughtered, go in the house, get clean. By the end of the, the sort of assembly line thing, they were packed in crates full of ice, put on trucks, and they were headed for Charlotte and Charleston and the different places in the South. We were the Purdue chicken before Purdue. Um, How long did those chickens take to grow <laughs> compared to today's chickens? Well, they grow in the wild, so um, you fed them, but they live in the wild. They live there, they live in the woods, literally. Um, so it took longer to grow, but these were real chickens. There was no artificial anything involved in their life, no antibiotics, anything like that. When they say range, free range, they were free range because they lived in the woods. Um, and we round them up at a certain time of the year, like you round up cattle, right? Um, so it was a much healthier uh, poultry line than what you have today. Um, and, and our families worked there, but we didn't just work in the poultry. Somebody had to work. The Vanderbilt family lived there, George Vanderbilt, um, before him his grandfather, Isaac Emerson. And the Vanderbilts, the, the George was the son of the Vanderbilt that died on the Lusitania. Um, and they made their money mainly in railroading and ferries. But the grandfather bought seven plantations and fused them together as one and called them Arcadia. But these were like Rose Hill for Lauren Hope, Clifton, um, a number of others, Fairfield. But these were all plantations where our people was once held in slaves. But my people were never enslaved on the, those plantations. We came there in the 20s as workers as a labor. And part of the labor, you live there on the plantation, free housing, free electricity, and so forth. And um, you participated fully in what that life was. It was like a city, really. So you had, there was four different villages. I lived in the Prospect Hill village. Um, and there were four, three other villages. We had our own service station, car repair, gas station, dry cleaners, laundromat, all of these things that you would find in a town. We had a dairy that we would milk the dairy cows. Everybody got milk from that dairy. Um, very high tech for the day because, of course, this was the Vanderbilt. We pasteurized our own milk at that time. We separate the cream from the milk. All of this was done there at the dairy. Um, we had, um, of course, slaughterhouses because they also um, would raise pigs for the market. Um, we used to go do a lot of trapping orders for skins, you know, um, and I was a good skinner too. By the time I was 14, I could skin anything you could put up on a, on a wall. Um, and we had our own school, our own school, which was a one room classroom. We had one teacher teaching first to the sixth grade. She died about three years ago. Her name was Betty Murray. Um, she was 98. We stayed friends throughout our life uh, together. It's the most extraordinary woman in the world. All of her children that came to that school went to college, nearly about, I'd say about 60 to 70 percent. Um, one lady, in one classroom, and the classroom was the old hospital that was used for enslaved Africans pre-Civil War. And after the Civil War, it was turned into a church and a school, St. Anne's Baptist. And, um, did you have <laughs> did you have healers in your community? 
that I have home? Healers. Healers. Healers? Yeah, healers. Like medical healers. Yeah, yeah. yeah my grandma was, a, was our primary healer. She was, we called them root women and root men. But they were the medical people. And everybody came to them, including whites. Um, when the, the white people referred to it as a snake bite, meaning our medicine don't work. So we need you. But most people would come by night. They would not come by day. And um, mama would go to their homes and she would um, never eat at their home. Sometimes she would have to stay at people home, black and white, three, four days working on them. But she would never eat in their home and she would never bathe in their home. Why was that? Um, I don't know. I guess it was part of the whole spiritual piece. If there was sickness in here, I'm not gonna become a part of that sickness. So we would take her food to her. And even when she bathed, we would take her foot up from my house and she would go in the backyard. Somebody would put up something and she would be there. I always wondered about this, right? Um, I know they have their herbs and roots in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. How did I identify the herbs and roots in a new land that did the same thing as those in their land? All content got intent. So once you learn what the fauna is, the, that means the plants, the vines, the herbs and stuff, you watch the animals see where animals go when they get sick. What grass do the dog eat when he gets sick? Where does the chicken go to eat when it gets sick? Where does the bird eat when it's sick? You learn from watching the animals. And you also learn from smell, taste, and different things like that. So I remember we would go with Mama, and we would have three or four of us. We'd have different bags, and we would pull certain things, roots, clean them off good. and. That would go in one bag, vines in another bag, berries in another bag. Some things would be used to make drinks. Some would be used to make polis, salve, to rub on your body. You know, others are used to soak and different things. Some are used to be ingested as medicine. But they learned this over time. And a part of it was the spiritual communication with the plant. The same kind of thing we saw with um, George Washington Carver. He said he spoke to the plants. Well, any good herbalist or, or root woman, you would call them, with your family being from the Caribbean, you would call that an obia man, an obia woman. Well, they learn to communicate with those plants. Something intuitive happens between them and the plant that say what the possibility and the relationship should be. You were Iman for over 11 years, right? Mm -hmm. From what I understand, you came to a point where you didn't, you didn't believe Islam was the religion for black people. Uh, when and why did your perspective on Islam change, or did it ever change? No, I never thought Islam was the, the no, I think Christianity was the salvation for black people. Um, I grew up in a Christian church, St. Anne's Baptist. My grandfather was the licensed minister. My mom, the root lady, was the head, head mother of the church. So we, we knew church. So I walked away from that at 17. I met Malcolm X at 16. Hold on before we jump. Why did you walk away from the church? Something inside of me and dreams was telling me that that wasn't. I knew the Bible very well and I read it. I saw the contradictions. I saw the, the wrong things. I saw the Hebrews slaughtering the Canaanites. I saw all of that. And I told my grandfather, I don't believe in this. This how can't be right. They, how did they respond? He cried, but he never tried to stop me. Uh, my grandfather name is Andrew Small. They used to call him Captain Man. He was a little short guy, but nobody messed with Captain Man. All right. um, he was the leader of the community, he was the head of the Masonic Lodges. He was in the Morris Science Temple, Knights of Pythias, Odd Fellows, and a licensed preacher. He was the political leader of our community. And um, I remember when we started picketing the theater, the movie theater in town, um, to integrate it. Him and the other people from my village and another village called Parkersville, they got together and said, we don't beg other people for anything. And they started showing movies in our church on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So we didn't have to go to the white folks theater. We went to the black folks theater. How did your father respond? You told me your father had a great relationship. How did you, he respond when you told him about that? My grandfather? Your father. My, my father. How did your father respond? He was cool. My father was cool. He, he was never much of a church man, you know. Um, this is a man who would like stay up with me 
until 3 and 4 in the morning to do my homework and then get up at 5 and 6 o'clock to go. He was a brick mason and to go, you know, build houses and to, to go to work. And he would do that two, three nights a week. Help me do my homework at 1, 2 in the morning and was up at 5 o'clock to go to work. I mean, he was like that kind of a father. Um, he had served in the Second World War. Um, he served in a division called the 92nd Division. Um, they fought in Europe, and, um, and they were so good, these, it was a black division, that after Hitler was defeated, they sent them all to, to the Pacific, and instead of letting them come home, then I realized it wasn't so much about their fighting, they wanted to kill them off before they could come back to America, because they had taste the blood of killing white people in Europe. Right? And me and him would talk about this. He was a very political, conscious black man, you know. Uh, listening to you speak about your grandfather and your father, I can see how their influence molded the type of person that you are today. Oh, yeah. I mean, Papa and Paul and my grandma and my mom. I mean, the family was always the leadership cadre. My grandfather, the one I call Papa, he came from the Freewood. He was, his family had never been enslaved. So this, right after they got over here, they ran away into the woods. The, what you call in the Caribbean, the Maroon community, we call it the Freewood over here. So they, they, they used the N-word, the Freewood ends, you know. And we were in those Freewoods until the 60s, before we started opening up to people coming in there. Um, and all down the eastern coast, nobody ever talks about the black Maroon communities here in America except the one in Florida, which we call the Cimarrones, which means Cima come from, they call the Seminoles, which come from the Spanish word Cimarron, which Jamaica get this word maroon from, and it simply means runaways. But they don't want to count them as runaways, so they must have been Indians, they were runaways. But the, Cimar the Seminoles were the Cimarrones, they were the Maroons. Florida was the biggest maroon community in North America. Right? And so my family on Papa's side come from the maroon community. On Mama's side, they come from a free labor community. Her mama, me, my grandmother, her, her uh, parents, her, grand, her mother, no, her grandmother was sold into slavery into Georgetown, South Carolina with two young children. And when they were sold to some people in Virginia, at 16, my grandpa, Joe Alston, who grew to be seven foot something, he escapes from the plantation in Virginia with his mother and his brother, the leper pool. And they walked back to South Carolina where they were sold into so slave they market. They walked from Virginia to South Carolina. And in Paulus Island, South Carolina, they were picked up and given a ride by a white, young white man from the Alston family. That was the biggest plantation owners around in that day. And they were taken on as free labor, never went back into slavery again. They were. They were, that's where the medicine side comes from. Um, my great-grandmother, Matt Hope, who was from Sierra Leone, was a Mindy. And then my great-grandpa, Joe, who's from Uganda, he was Tutsi. And they both were medicine persons. They were both healers, traditionalists. And then my grandmother, their daughter, inherited from them. We have to finish going back to the Oman now. I know we, we sidetracked talking about your family. Uh, please tell us now, you were saying originally you never thought Islam or Christianity right. was a religion for black people. Right. I heard about this man back in 1963 on TV and then radio named Malcolm X. So my mother and father had moved to New York already, and they lived in Harlem. So I asked my mother to bring me to New York so I could meet Malcolm X, which my mother did. And we would go to the temple every week, but I could never meet this man. So shortly before I'm to return, the, the March of Washington was going on, and my mom was on the March of Washington. And so we went to the mosque one day, the temple then on 116th Street. We lived on 115th Street, me and his brother named Dwight. And we wanted to meet the minister. And I guess they thought we were crazy coming in to meet the minister, two young guys, 16 years old. And um, they said the minister was giving out flyers down on 141st Street in front of the food family supermarket. Well, I worked in that supermarket packing groceries, me and my brother. So me and Dwight went down there and I met this tall, light-skinned, well-dressed man. 
I rem only thing I remember, he spoke to Dwight and I maybe 10 minutes, a little more. But the only thing I remember him telling me when I told him I was going to leave, not go back south, I was going to leave school, I was coming to join them. And he told me that education was one of the things that was going to free our people. And then I needed to stay in school and I needed to go to college. Malcolm X was my emphasis for going to college, you know. And so he wasn't Malcolm X then to the world. He was just Malcolm X to me, a South Carolina child, seeing this black man speaking like that on the TV. And so he's still in the Nation of Islam. Nobody knows of him then. I met him, though. How then. was his aura when you met him during that time? Was it, did he have that uh, magnet thing going on at the time? He was a very, he had the biggest smile in the world. He could go from smile to serious, like zip, right? Um, but he was very kind, very articulate. You know, he made everything understandable when he spoke. And that's all I can remember about him. I would never meet him again. I go back home, I decided I'm Malcolm X. Well, they didn't go for that stuff in Georgetown, South Carolina. So I had a difficult time that year, and I joined the Naval Reserve to make a little extra money for the house. I thought I could get on when I wanted to, because that didn't work well. Um, but when they heard my beliefs, they railroaded me on ex active duty the day of graduation. I didn't, wasn't even able to go to my own graduation party, right? I had to head for Pensacola, Florida, Naval Air Station. Um, even though I had a full college deferment, they had sabotaged that, meaning the whites in, 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 in the center. And I had to go on active duty. And so that developed a bitterness um, towards the white community at the time. I'd never been, I grew up on Acadia where, where I worked very closely with the white community, that was, there was a very small white community and an overwhelming black community. I worked in the house of the Vanderbilts, and we were like family, really, and that's not a cliche. Um, um, we, we were so much like family. When Mrs. Vanderbilt, the last Vanderbilt, died a few years ago, I was called home to come and speak at a funeral. All right. um, you don't get that, okay, especially who I am. When the CIA and the FBI went down there to do um, a 411 on me many years back, she was the first one to call me and said, James, some people just left my house. And I said, um, what were they doing at your house? He said, it was the FBI and the CIA. They said that you are advocating the overthrow of the government of the United States. <laughs> so they wanted to talk to everybody that went to school with you, everybody that worked with you, everybody that knew you, everybody that was your family. This well, what year was that when the FBI started looking to you? Um, this had to be late 70s, early 80s. So what group were you a part of at that time? Still working with Panther Party, working with the OAU. Um, at that time, I'm up in Boston with Ella. We were trying to rebuild the network and the economic base for OAU. Um, Black Liberation Army had been formulated. I was involved with those brothers. Um, with a brother named that I really miss, named Mantu Matsumela. Um, we were both close to um, um, uh, our brother who just passed. Um, oh goodness, something, Baba Shakur, uh, Matula Shakur. But I was closer to his other two brothers than to Matula. But Matula was at that time working at Lincoln Hospital using acupuncture to deal with heroin addicts. And that was at the same time the system was trying to push. Um, um, what's that medicine that we're giving you to get you off of um, heroin? Methadone. methadone. And so he was challenging the whole methadone thrust, and that's why they went after him, right? But he had two, two older brothers, Zaid Shakur, and who was um, the husband of Asada Shakur. That was my closest friend, my best friend. And then an older brother, Lumumba Shakur, who was the head of the Black Panther Party chapter in Harlem. And Zaid was the head of the chapter in the Bronx. And so I was in that world, you know. But we didn't think that world would be such a big world in history. We were just youngsters doing our thing, you know. I got to be the E-man because I had rebuilt the, the foundation of the OAAU, right? Ella, Malcolm's sister, was the president. 
I was in the hierarchy of it with no title because I was her bodyguard. So I was everywhere doing everything. But I recruited mostly Vietnam vets into the organization because I wanted soldiers. And I realized they didn't have spiritual foundation. So I asked that the Muslim mosque be reopened. And a committee came together made of Saudis, Sudanese, African Americans, and mostly from New Jersey, Hisham Jabba out of Elizabeth, who buried Malcolm, Camille Wadu out of the Allah Houdini Arabic Society, out of Newark, um, brothers from Sudan, Saudi Arabia, and this committee started searching for an imam to head Malcolm's mosque. And after a week, we were downstairs in the center because we had our own building. Haji Sham Jabba came down and told me, says, um, you were elected as the imam. I thought, I didn't put my name in as imam. I don't have nothing to do with religion. I had enough religion growing up. Oh, I'm not interested in imam, Islam, or anything. I think these brothers need it. <laughs> so they go back into another week of searching. So they, they're interviewing everybody, Imam Tawfiq, all the imams who went home. And at the end of the next week, Hisham came down into the mosque in the center, double as a mosque in the center, and says, um, Brother Small, walk with me around the block. Yeah. It was a walk I should have never taken, right? Yeah. We walk around the block and said, look, they elected you again as the email. Yeah. I said, but I didn't put my name in. He said, Ella puts your name in. And I said, so Ella's trying to broker a power thing here and then use the dude that she thinks she can control. So I said, nah, I ain't got nothing to do with it. So he said, no, Ella said, if you do this for her for one year, give us a chance to send a young man, a couple of young men over to the East, get some training, learn the language. And if you can just hold us down, because I was the loyalist soldier. I was the super hit man revolutionary, you know. So I said, okay. And that one year turned into 11 years, because that was their intent all along. You know, I went to Mecca in 1974. So hold on. When you were at when you were doing this, so you never really had a conviction for Islam while you were doing this? No. All right. I had a conviction to free black people, and if Islam was going to help to do that, then I would do Islam. Yeah. And so I brought a lot of soldiers in. I won't call their names because I don't have the permission. I trained a lot of brothers who went on to do a lot of things in the world with their PhDs in black studies and law degrees and other things came through our network uh, there in the mosque. Uh, what was the method for converting people, not just uh, converting people morally in regards to cleaning them up? Well, I wasn't into the proselytizing thing. You came because that's what you wanted to do. For the brothers who was in OAU, I gave them that option and brought in teachers. So we did classes. So we had classes in the language. We had classes in the history, African history. We had classes in metaphysics. And certainly we had classes in the religion overall. And so almost seven days a week, we had something going on at the Center for the Brothers and Sisters. And it's through that process that you saw transformation. You saw some people drop out and went someplace else. But most people went through the transformation. Um, I didn't allow polygamy. So a lot of people left the mosque because polygamy was then a big thing for black men and their weaknesses at that time. I didn't think we were strong enough to take care of one woman, so how then can we do three, four women? So I voted against having polygamy, and um, my defense was the Quran itself. There's nothing in the Quran that allows you to have multiple wives as a general proposition. Okay, there's only one occasion. After the Battle of Badar, the first major revolutionary battle that Prophet Muhammad Wasallam takes part in, some of the Muslim soldiers get, brothers get killed. Now their wives are orphans, I mean their children, girl children are orphans and their wives are widows in a hostile Judeo-Christian uh, environment. And so Muhammad says to the Muslim brothers, O ye Muslim men, take from among the widows and the orphans of your brothers killed in battle, as many as your heart can possess, meaning you can treat equally up to four. Where, where did this idea come from? Because uh, polygamy and Islam and popular culture seems to go hand in hand. So where did this idea come from? That? From, from Arabism, people watching the Arab world, looking at Arab history, where people are having a hundred wives and these harems. None of that is Islamic. Matter of fact, it's fundamentally anti-Islam. O ye Muslim men, 
take from among the orphans and the widows of your brothers killed in battle, as many as your heart can possess, mean you can love equally, treat fairly, up to four. That was to keep other non-Muslim men from abusing them. In African general culture, polygamy existed, but as the minority proposition, monogamy is the African proposition, not polygamy. Polygamy is the exception in African culture. But people love the idea of having more than one woman in a, a legitimate framework rather than dealing with the responsibility of building family. You know, so that's what it came down to. And so these are the kinds of things we were struggling with at that time. And so, and it still exists today. You know, people still have the wrong uh, reason. Well, Let uh, me tell you why Africans created polygamy. Even today, for every one male child, there's two to three female male children. Well, it was the same a thousand years ago. The Africans decide, what do we do with the surplus Muslim population? I mean, female population. Europe took the surplus female population and made them whores and prostitutes. Africa didn't do that. Africa said those who can afford to and could properly take care of should marry more than one woman so that your female population get the same opportunity to have families and children like any other element of the population and you don't develop that whore class, prostitute class that developed in Europe. So, Is that plain enough? No, very right. But with the African, now, I always hear people argue and they say historically Africans practice polygamy. So where did this get into the street history? <laughs> the same call. reason people are celebrating 50 years of hip hop without dealing with the damage and the destruction hip hop did to black community in that 50 years. Now white people want to make some more money off of them, milk them like great cows again, so now they're going to have 50 year celebration, but some glorious music dance tradition that never happened that way. And so the same way when we look at polygamy, we don't ask why polygamy, where polygamy, who polygamy, how polygamy. We just talk about polygamy. Some poor guy who can barely grow two rows of beans, how's he going to have two wives and take care of two wives, all right? Um, those people who took more than one wife was people who had the wherewithal to take care of more than one wife because you had to provide a separate home for each of those women, all right? And you had to provide for them equally. And that polygamy was not a male control institution, it was a female run institution. You didn't choose who the, your wives are going to be. Your wives chose who your wives are going to be. So the, the first wife would choose the other wives? That's right. Not just the first wife, but maybe the first wife, her mother, your mother, your aunties. The women of the house made that choice. Okay? Depending on the need of the house, you know and your capability to afford to take care of another family element. So in which was made polygamy a minority function, not a majority function. So polygamy should not be a conversation in modern day black community? No, we're not capable of taking care of one woman, let alone multiple women. I felt that way in the 60s, I feel that way now. Because that didn't make me happy with the Muslims of that day, because everybody was running toward that trend. And so I told them, well, you can pack up and leave the Muslim mosque in, because it's not going to be practiced here. But when they, when they approach polygamy, they don't understand the concept of providing for new They're Muslims. just looking for sex. sex. It's all about sex, OK? And they don't even understand sex. The average black man or white man don't even know how to make love to a woman. You know, They're caught up in poor white cultural fantasy, you know, poor white cultural fantasy that's not predicated on any significant value or ethical moral foundation. Uh, being that Africa is such a massive land mass, many people struggle with categorizing African spirituality. Is African spirituality just the spiritual practices of the cultures we know about and have been exposed to, or is African spirituality a representation of the spiritual practices of the entire continent? Well, African spirituality is a misnomer because we don't approach things in Africa from an African spirituality perspective. That spirituality thing is kind of like an offshoot of how white people look at what they don't want to include in what they call religion. I talk about African sacred science and it's universal to the continent. What's different is the ecology you find yourself um, trying to explain reality in, 
and, and um, the environment and what's the tools are there for you to, to do that explaining. African spirituality is explaining cosmology and ecology to the human person and the, looking at the relationship between the three. What is the relationship to, to cosmology, cosmogony, and ecology and environment to the human being? And what is the human being's relationship to it? All right. The science that's explaining all of those things is called the African sacred science. That's what people are misnomally calling African spirituality. It's universal to the continent because everybody's trying to explain the same thing. But if you're in the desert, you're not going to use the same tools that the person in the rainforest use. All right. If you're in the rainforest, you're not going to use the same tools that the people in the, in, in the grassland plains are going to use. Because what you have in your environment is different. So how do I explain the sun in the desert? What am I going to use? How do I explain the sun in the rainforest? But both of us will be trying to explain the sun because it's universal. All right. <coughs> That's the, you brought up something else I want to ask, right? Can the term you use, sacred science, so I'll just use that moving forward for this, right? Mm -hmm. Can sacred sciences travel to a different environment? Because if you had that experience in a certain environment, can you have that experience in another environment? Let me explain. You as human, whether you are in Timbuktu, South Africa, Nigeria, or China, your needs is fundamentally the same. Your clothing may change, your language may change, the type of food may change depending on what that environment grows. But the food that you eat will have to produce, even though there will be different foods, it will have to produce the same vitamins you would need no matter where else you live in the world. That's sacred science. The moon is the moon. It's not going to change whether you live in China or South Carolina. The sun is the sun. It's not going to change whether you live in South Jersey, Jersey or in Westchester County. Now, how do you explain the sun? And how do you make sure you get the health, healthy vitamin D energy of the sun that your body needs on a daily basis? It depends on the environment you're in. That will determine what type of clothes you wear, what color clothes you wear, right? How heavy the clothes, how thin the clothes. That will determine what other supplementary stuff you have to eat to make sure you're getting enough vitamin D, right? So if I need to make sure I'm getting um, the, the, the necessary nutrients that if I get from greens, but I'm living in an environment where I can't grow a lot of green, then can I find that same nutrient in some sort of seafood or in an animal food or in a fruit? You understand? Nothing would change. Your body's needs remain the same. But what in your environment that you have to use to fulfill that need may change because ecologically you're in a different setting, all right? The sacred science is your understanding of the setting you're in and its relationship to you and how you interrelate, you know? How do you interrelate? Um, the sun is the sun. The sun don't go to China and say, okay, today I'm the Chinese sun and start speaking Chinese. It's the sun. The Chinese person have to explain their relationship to the sun. They may use mythology, allegory, folklore, fairy tales to te as teaching tools for their population to explain the value of the sun to them and the danger of the sun to them. Same thing for us. If we lived in Congo, we would use different tools than the Chinese, but we would have to explain the same thing. What is the value of the sun to us? What is the value of the sun to the plants that we eat? What is the value? You know, when I eat a plant, I'm virtually eating sunlight. Right? I'm eating sunlight. Now, in certain environments, they can't grow a whole lot of plants, so they can't get sunlight that way. So they're going to eat a lot of fish to get that same vitamin D. Okay? And so African sacred science is understanding ecology, you know, environment, cosmology, and the human being's role in all of this. And so if you live in Nigeria, and you got in, like your family, more than likely you're from Ghana, and more than likely you're from the Akan people where Nana and Kofi came from, and Kojo. All three of those are Akan names. And so when you left Ghana for Jamaica, nothing changed except the ecology. 
the Akan people who make up the majority of the Jamaican people's population, right? When they left Ghana and Ivory Coast, where the, the predominant Akan people live in West Africa, they didn't stop being Akans, nor did they need change. What changed was the environment. Now they have to identify new sources of the nutrients they need to survive. But the, 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 the nutrients needed is the same nutrient needed when they were in Ghana. Now what has changed is how I acquire them and what kind of rituals I attach to them. Okay, a ritual could be a prayer, a libation, a song, a dance, a drum rhythm, you know, to celebrate that we have in this month, this fruit is growing, so breadfruit is a big deal this month. Um, mango coming at a certain season, the mango, people may look and think it's just some juicy, sweet, sugary fruit, but mango brings all kinds of nutrients to the table, you know what I'm saying? Well, African people knew this, you know, bananas, plantain, yams, and so I may not be able to grow the yam the way I did in Africa, but I know in this part of the environment in Jamaica, I could find yam growing wild, right? And so I have a yam festival every year in Ghana. Well, I have a yam festival in Jamaica too, but I may do a different dance than it did in Ghana um, because we were different people under different circumstances. But nothing has changed about our fundamental need from nature. That is the sacred science to understand that. What is that fundamental need from nature that the human being requires? What is the fundamental understanding between knowing when the star is right there and the Big Dipper is right there and it's turned this way, at the same time on Earth, this thing is happening. And if I watch it long enough and it comes back around the next year, when the Big Dipper is there and his handle is turned this way, at the same time on Earth, that same thing is happening, I go, aha! That's the law. That's the law of God, or that's the law of nature, or that's the fundamental, this African sacred science, understanding the relationship between cosmology and ecology, and our role in it. And much of what the West call his science is stolen African sacred science. <laughs> and it didn't even st steal it. We gave it to him because most of them uh, derive into Western culture during the period of enslavement, which he calls this period of the Renaissance and Enlightenment. That's the period when he's got millions of African people mine, enslaved, creating his, what would become his, what they call that thing, Industrial Revolution. I heard you once say Christianity never started as a religion. It started as a political system. Mm -hmm. How did Christianity evolve from a political system to a religion? Well, when the political system that you're living in, like Christian, let's look at Christianity under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, which takes over much of what we call the Middle East and North Africa and the Mediterranean area right on up to uh, Spain, Britain, and the UK, um, and into what is Turkey. This is one of the biggest empires ever built in those days. And this, it's in this empire what we know as Christianity today is born. Now, Christianity as a method of looking at a people's spiritual system is born in Africa because the Ethiopian church is older than the Catholic church, right? The ancient Sudanese church is older than the Catholic church. But when people talk about Christianity, they start their genesis with the Catholic church and then Martin Luther in the 1500s. But by the time we get Martin Luther, the Ethiopian church is a thousand years old. By the time we get the Catholic church, the Ethiopian church is 500 years old. So <clears throat> we got to separate those two Christianities. I want to make that clear going in. The Christianity we know today, which starts out as Roman ideology after the Nicene Conference, where Rome has now military conquered all of what was the Greek world and the Egyptian world and, and the Mesopotamian world. It went there not to just conquer people. They wanted the olives. They wanted the grapes. They, to make the wine. They wanted the wheat. They wanted the barley. They wanted the sheep. They wanted the cattle. They wanted the maize. They wanted all of the things. They wanted the silver. They wanted the iron. They wanted the gold. This is what they were invading people for. 
to steal their raw materials, the same reason they're doing it today on a larger, more high-tech scale. But once you do that, you've got to now manage all these people. How do you do that? That's right. And so you said, well, what is it the, that they had that was working that we don't have? And so you call together the best of their spiritual minds at a conference called Nicaea. And he says, help me to construct a socialization process for the daily living of the people. Today we call that ideology. But then what happens, in the course of gathering all this wealth and power, you create another ideology, an economic ideology, which we now call capitalism. But to control the mass of the people that feed that ideology, you still need your initial ideology, which is that socializing instrument, which we now will call religion. And religion partners with the capitalist ideology to see do what we are seeing today. It's really not that complicated to watch the evolution if you just study history. <coughs> history will erase the mystery. I also heard you once say, right, <laughs> mm -hmm. Europeans are economic terrorists, mm -hmm. master liars, and plagiarists who have never created a civilization <coughs> based on the rules of civilization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before giving us the historical evidence for this claim, can you explain to the viewers what are the rules or characteristics of a civilization? The base, most basic characteristic of civilization is respect for human life respect for nature, respect for ecology, you know, respect for cosmology, because all of these things work together. Like say, you and I, we want to plant some barley. Well, we can't just plant the barley any time of the year. You have to plant the barley a certain time of year, so you must master the, the cosmology to know where the stars are, where the moon is, where the sun is, at the time that's appropriate for planting barley. I've got to also know in my environment, what is the weather condition? Is it warm? Is it cold? Is it rainy? Is it dry? Which is the best time of year? So that's a part of civilizing is the science of managing and respecting ecology and cosmology. This is the most fundamental. Then respecting human life, that you can't just kill people to take things that you need to build human relationship to learn how to share things. That's most fundamental in civilization. And that you can begin to build the systems that allow for you to feed, clothe, and shelter your population without warfare, murder, or mayhem, or genocide, as we've seen Europe do for millennia now. And so when we think of civilization, you think of people who are living according to an order. They've studied the laws of nature. They've studied the laws of cosmos ecology. They've turned those into their artificial social laws, and they live according to those laws that give them harmony and balance. I was saying, yeah, listening to you, just to sum it up, civilization is man mimicking the universe, the universe how it's able to work together. Yes. That's like the best definition. That's sacred science. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, so for the second part, right, uh, why do you say Europeans never created a civilization? Show me one. <laughs> That's the only question I've had. Show me a European civilization. Rome was not a civilization. Greece was not a civilization. You don't know a day in the history of Greece where there wasn't a war. You don't know a day in the history of Rome and it wasn't a war. Those are not civilization. Those are death cults, war culture. They're not building anything. They're stealing from other people, borrowing from other people, and still carrying on this anti-human, anti-nature behavior of murdering, stealing, to conquer and appropriate something that belonged to someone else that you could have gotten by just shaking the hands and making a deal. I want to talk about Vietnam War. Most people are unaware that Congress authorized troop deployment in Vietnam, but because it did not issue a declaration of war on North Vietnam or Viet Cong, the Vietnam War, technically speaking, is not considered a war in the United States, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> do you believe the Vietnam War was about oil? Yeah. It's about oil and surprisingly about rice. 
See, we know now it's about oil that had been discovered off of the shores. But it was also about rice and other precious metals, gold and other things found in the environment. Remember, Vietnam was under the control of the French. But when the Algerian Revolution takes place, France has to shift its military from Vietnam to Northern Africa. They had hoped that America and Britain, being their allies, would help them maintain control until they could shift back. You come to take that over. But America stepped in to take it for itself. And, and they wanted the, the raw material, natural resources. They wanted control. They wanted a base that would give them <clears throat> uh, a space close to China as they were trying to stop the Chinese move. Um, and, but they also wanted to control the rice staple population. Rice is the biggest staple in the world. Everybody in the world eats rice. Who do you think is the biggest rice exporter to the world? The United States of America. So if you use Agent Orange and you destroy the Vietnamese ability to grow rice, because you've poisoned and then you become the biggest exporter of rice to the world. So was the, was the war more of a corporate war than a political war? Both. Mm -hmm. You had the political ideologues, you know, and you had uh, Eisenhower warned us in his speech, and ironically, my speech, my last speech I had to give in high school was called, by Dwight David Eisenhower, it was called Beware of the Military Industrial Complex. This is Dwight David Eisenhower, a general and a president, warning the people as he's stepping down from the president to beware of the military industrial complex. Well, the military industrial complex, the Grumman, the, the many of the automobile companies that we know, they make their billions from people being at war because they make the war equipment. So it's in the interest of that corporate enterprise to keep war going somewhere so that they can continue to make equipment and replace what's damaged. And so that's one of the forces. You also had the force of those who were coming for economic reasons, the oil, the natural resources in Vietnam that had yet to be exploited. The French had just begun to exploit, even though the French had been there for 400 years. And so, and of course the rice. You're talking about feeding the world's population. Rice is a staple to every dinner table across the world. It's a trillion dollar industry. Nobody talks about it. It's so funny. Like people just miss that altogether. You know? And then you have the ideologues who are caught up on we're bringing democracy to the world and we're destroying communism in the world. So you got these three pieces married together and going into Vietnam and they got their butt with. You know? The um another part of it, um, why was drug abuse so rampant among soldiers during the Vietnam War? Because the, the Vietnam War was probably, the, it not was, the first time America had to engage against a guerrilla army that knew the terrain that they were in. What makes guerrilla warfare so successful is that the guerrilla fighter knows the ecology and the environment and can use it to their advantage. And so the Americans had not been trained for any such type of warfare. And so this is, so just to keep their soldiers on the battlefield, they were fed drugs by their own, their own government. But that's not irresponsible of military personnel to put your soldiers in a position they're not trained for? Uh, they had no other soldiers trained to put in that position. <laughs> so what they had, they didn't, they had no idea uh, that what guerrilla warfare was like. They had no idea what true freedom fighters were about. Um, America had never been in a war by itself before. It, in the Second World War, it was the, all of the Western world, wasn't America. In the First World War, it was all of the Western world. Okay? In the War of 1812, much America had Russia on its side and France on its side. Amer Vietnam was the first time America had to take on an ally by itself, and it got whipped the hell out of there. I refused. I was in the military, and there were many of us who refused to serve in Vietnam. We were war resistors in the military, okay? 
And so people had to pay a big penalty for doing that. I paid a penalty. They fined you, they punish you, they court-martial you. Um, I had a lot of lucky thing on my side. Some of the brothers didn't fare so well. I knew brothers who were part of my grouping, and I only learned like a few years ago when I'm trying to find out what happened to the rest of the brothers after I got out. And cause they went to Da Nang. The ship I was on, the USS Manly, I loaded on the front uh, anti-aircraft gun. Well, that whole magazine blew up a month after they went to Vietnam, so I would have been no more had I gone to Vietnam, had I not resist. I would have died with all of my friends. And the other brothers from across the, the, the flotilla that we were with, Cam Dejran 4, the resistors, I was told that then the Nang, they were sent on a mission when they got it loaded into the truck and turned the key, all of them was taken out by their own government. So, so go back to the drugs, though, in regards, because it seems like it created a big problem. Like, you're saying they were given the drugs just to sedate them and keep them there? No, then they, nothing's that overt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's covert. They were given access to the drug. Nobody's going to stand in the way of you getting it. They know that the drug's going to keep you hyped and ready to go and fight. Um, so it was allowed, and it's probably even facilitated to a great degree by the military. You know. how, did the, uh, their addi- how did their addictions impact their communities in America when they returned? That's an easy question. It was destructive. It was destructive. You have so many of these young men coming back home addicted to heroin, and at that time the heroin trade in the black community was at a boom to be followed immediately by the crack cocaine um, uh, epidemic, which we know was run by the American military, General Secord, and Ar- Colonel Oliver North. Um, we knew they were bringing the drugs into the country. We knew the American CIA was working with the American military. And under the guise, they were raising money for the Contra. But it was also a way to control and poison a black community. But all these black soldiers coming back home, you don't want them to become Black Panthers and black m- Muslims and others, so turn them into drug addicts and put them in the penitentiary. You lived through both. Which one was worse, the heroin era or the crack era? Crack was by far the most vicious because it was so immediately addictive, you know, and so hard to extract <coughs> yourself from. And because it was so done so sophisticatedly, it was, it was an organized government attack on the black community. You established a credit union in New York and Ghana, mm-hmm. right? I want to speak about the one in New York. What is the process of opening a credit union in our community? Well, the first thing you have to do is um, what they call needs assessment. So that, that that particular community needs access to a banking process um, that fits their income level. And believe it or not, the government actually will train you will give you free training to do this um, at both the state and the federal level to, to show you how to run a uh, credit union. And then you have to do a petition. You have to get a certain amount of pledges, people pledging that I will deposit my money in this union. And then you have to get a certain amount of seed money because you have to have a facility. You have, have to have an office complex. You have to have an administrative structure that you can put together, and then you have to have a way to secure money, you know, like safe, so for the things you can have in a small banking operation. But the government will show you how to do all of this. And so we actually did it, but like most enterprise, um, and we, and we were in Harlem, and we had an office on 107th Avenue at first, and then 116th Street. But at the end of the day, we found that we got sold out and sabotaged by people from the inside, from those who didn't want to see a black credit union put together by people who were not part of the system, quote unquote. Uh, What year was this? Mm, I just returned. So this had to be somewhere between 80, 85, 82, 85. All right, so you got the credit union up and running, and you said, what, what occurred, though, when you say sabotage? People took money and 
to sabotage agreements because now you have to get agreements of people to make deposits. And there were people who wanted to make deposits. But then I mean, you have people in the critical leadership, and I'm not going to call anybody's name on this program, um, and they make the wrong decisions. But then they're no longer living in Harlem, but in a house in Jersey. You've got to fundamentally ask the question, what just happened here? You know? Um, no one wanted to see a credit union because a credit union needed an economic independence routing of elements of the black community. But you don't know that when you're doing this. You thought people were going to cheer you on. And then you realize they're not cheering us on. They're trying to make sure we can't come into being because they lose control over the economic hegemony in the black community. And we, later on, we would establish one in Ghana which still exists. A group of us from here bought a hotel complex in Ghana and working with others from North America who already live there and have business and other Ghanaian, indigenous Ghanaian people, we established a small credit union there uh, that's still operative, you know. And we give small, um, what they call industrial loans, uh, a loan may be $100 for someone trying to open a food stand side of road in Ghana, $100 is a lot of money, you know. Another person may need $1,000 because they're trying to do something else. And so <clears throat> a credit union really allows you to deal with um, helping people in what they call uh, microfinancing. Um, a, a bank would not touch you, give you that, that little bit of money. But a credit union could give you that money. And, and if you get a good payback process, you can sustain the union. What does Dr. Claude Anderson mean when he speaks about aggregating money? Yeah, Dr. Anderson, one of the most extraordinary economic mind we've had this century trying to instruct us. And we should read everything, um, especially Powernomics, one of his books is called Powernomics and to be instructed and informed on how to use money and how to see money. And, and so when he talks about aggregating, he's trying to talk to black people about bringing your money together. That last year we spent about two or three trillion dollars, um, but we are spending it as a bunch of individuals. That if we were to bring that two trillion dollars together, or just one third of it together, in some sort of banking arrangement where I can loan money to you to build a house, where I can loan money to you to send your children to school, where you can open your savings account with us, that we take that half a trillion dollars and let it work together. So your son said, well, I don't want to go to college. I want to be a carpenter, but I need to rent a storefront or buy that building in order to open my carpentry business or my plumbing business, they would be able to come to that pot of money. And, and so you're aggregating the money so it's feeding the black community and it's growing itself in the black community. Right now we're feeding everybody else community and there's no instrument where we're growing ourselves significantly in the black community. As a man, I've been fighting and working for black people for decades, right? Mm -hmm. What is the issue with I'm not saying black people don't work together. I want to be mm -hmm. clear, because you have mm -hmm. many black people who do work together. But on a mass scale, what is the biggest issue with this trusting and working together? That shouldn't be an issue. It's slavery. You can't wipe out slavery as not having an effect on the people. And then what people call Jim Crow, that's slavery. This is genocide. They may call it Jim Crow. How do you call lynching somebody Jim, Jim Crow and make it sound like it's some cute little arrangements you have, or talk about slavery like it's some work program. It's genocide, 400 years of it. And other, unlike most black populations in the Western Hemisphere, the African American population had to grow up and create itself in the middle of a white state. Jamaicans was in a black state with a minority white population. Haiti was in a black state. Dominican Republic was either in a colored state, because they don't want to call themselves black, you know? Um, Trinidad is a black and Indian state. In North America, this was a white state. And yet we created ourselves in this white state in such an enormous way. Everybody from everywhere else have to come here to imitate being us while saying, well, I don't understand you. 
Yeah, because you ain't at war with these devils. You come in and think that's your brother, you know. You think that's your friend. I've been at war for 500 years. And he has a sophisticated social construct for my destruct. And he's trying to bring that sight on you. The minute you become no longer an asset to them and an asset to the larger black population, boom. Marcus Garvey was from Jamaica. But they saw him as the enemy right? from day one. And he was able to do this enormous work in a short period of time. But they finally got to him, put him in prison, finally deported him from the country. He died such a young man, mostly from a broken heart and shit. Right? And, but, but the stress of having to go up against a system like that, those who don't understand that you're fighting this massive, the most powerful white military and political structure ever built in history. This thing is more powerful than Rome and Greece combined, okay? It's more powerful than England and France. It's called the United States of America. It is the symbol of white supremacy and white bastionship over the world. And it is in that that black people have to create and recreate themselves and survive. And people, if you don't understand that, it can be very confusing. Um, and then you're dealing with a massive population. The African-American population, they say 40 to 45 million. I say it's about 60 million people. And if you count our brothers and sisters, you know, they don't count you. You know that, right? They separate us. But they don't do that with white people. If you come from Italy, you're white. That's right. If you come from England, you're white. But if you come from Jamaica, Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, Haiti, they don't count you with the black population in America. And they got us in a trick where we'll we checking off these different boxes. White folks ain't got no different box, they got one box. Right? But they get us to define ourselves on our own. And so you got to watch all the tricks of the trade that they've been using to keep, because in reality, the African population is the largest population in North America, all right? But because they chopped us up in little chunks, they made us see the little chunks in our head. Oh, you Jamaican, you Trinidad, you Nigerian, you Ghanaian, you black American. No, stupid. We all <laughs> African. We all want people, all right? You know, we just come from different cultural expressions. You got the guy in South Carolina don't have the same culture as the black guy in California. You know, we in America, but he got a whole nother culture going on out there. Whole nother value system going on out there. And that's cool, there's nothing wrong with that. The guy in Mississippi, he, he ain't into the same culture as the guy in Cincinnati, you know. But we've got to come together to understand how to bring the African world together. Because we didn't stop being African whether we went to um, what's the place where I love it? I was in Caracou, or we went to Port-au-Prince, or we went to port of spain or we went to Georgetown, South Carolina. We didn't stop being Africans. We were African in all of those places, but we're facing different circumstances to survive, to provide that food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security, those essentials. That when you step out your bed in the morning, your mind got to be on, I got to provide the essential for my household. Food, clothing, shelter, stepped in the morning. I ain't got time with this race stuff. I ain't got time with this revolutionary stuff. I, I got to provide these essentials. Now, a few people from a few of the families will say, okay, I'm going to fight. But most, the overwhelming majority of the families is just trying to provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security. What Claude Anderson is saying, okay, that's cool. But let's aggregate it. Let's get control of the economic politics and culture then where we live. And let's get control of land, labor, and resources where we live. And then we can produce, you know, our credit union, our banking system. And then we can circulate that dollar in our community. So it goes from the guy in the bank to the guy that want to um, open the business, so needs to buy the building, to the guy he's got to buy the tools from, right, to the guy who's going to rent the truck to him so he can transport those tools, right, and, to, and, uh, and so the whole community. Now he got to get his work clothes, uniforms, he got his man clean, so he goes to the black man who got the laundromat down the street, right? And he got to go and get his laundromat fixed, so he got to go to the plumber who's down. That's what aggregating is. Um, you know? When we have these conversations, like, people will talk about racism, but they don't talk about economic warfare. Because they don't understand it. Yeah. They don't understand that someone is deliberately 
keeping you from organizing your economics. It comes in how you deal with housing. It comes in. I think there's access to loans, man, spe specifically well, well, for business. That, that's the critical one. That's the killer. The man. banking. That's the whole thing they call redlining, right? Where it says people that live in this place don't give them loan. That's all redlining. What people when people hear redlining, they don't know what to talk about. The government makes maps, right? That bankers look at and says, okay, people who live in this zone, the green zone, we can get them loan. People in the blue zone, we can give them certain kind of loan. But the people in the red zone, we don't give them no loan. And that's almost always us. And if you can't get loans to open your business, if you can't get loans to buy the vehicles to attend your business, if you can't get loans to resupply yourself or to expand your business, then you're not going to thrive. You know, that's again, how do I provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security? So they force you to be, what, a consumer and a labor workforce for their enterprises instead of you being creators of your own enterprise. And you can't create your own enterprise if you don't have access to capital. And you can't have access to capital unless you have access to loans. And you can't give access to loans according to their standard unless you qualify in this credit rating. But you can't get the credit rating because nobody give you the access to the loan, right? So, and then the craziest thing, the way they run the credit rating in America, say, if I got terrible credits, right, because I refuse to work in the system, I will not work in the system. My credit is rock bottom, been there for 40 years, because I will not let you use that chain around my neck. I will find another way, right? But they, they if you can't get access to the loans, and they tell you, okay, we'll give you a credit card, but we're going to charge you a higher interest. You're the one who can't pay now, Already but I'm going to charge you a higher interest. interest than somebody who can pay. That is stupid, but that is a debilitating way of keeping you out of the marketplace, keeping you from getting back. So what Dr. Anderson said, let's find our own ways to aggregate. Aggregate simply means to bring our monies together. That's where credit unions come in, in the black community. And credit unions could then evolve through amalgamation, again, coming together to become banks. And then the banks, of course, can service that community's interest around the acquisition of land, their ability to pay for the labor they need, and so forth. Land, labor, and to get the resources you need to facilitate the people and the land and the, and the labor force that you're working with. So we need to study but not so much study we need, because the average person knows exactly what they need. It's just that they can't get it. They know they need the, the, the labor. They know they need the, the opportunities for loans. But how can you get the, the loan, right? How do you get that opportunity? And if somebody deliberately realizing that, if I let this population of 40 to 50 million, 60 million black people develop economically where I can then build relationship to Jamaica and to Trinidad and to Haiti like they're building to Czechoslovakia, Italy and, 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 and Switzerland, they would be in trouble. So it's up to us to recreate ourselves economically. And a lot of people are trying to do it. Let's not put our people down. Um, we spent last year better than $2 trillion because we made better than $2 trillion. There's only 11 nations in the world that had more surplus money than that. Okay. Our problem is ours is not organized. And that's what Dr. Anderson is talking about aggregating, organizing your money. And it isn't because we're not organized. We probably, our problem is we are over-organized. There's too many black organizations. We can get rid of 50% of yeah. them. Huh? No, it's too much. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. If we could resolve 50% of them, bring them together. Take the Soros, just the Soros and fraternities in the colleges. They're all operating as little individual group. But that my little pink and my little red and my little blue and da 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 and I got a little program going in Africa where I'm digging wells, and I'm over here building a clinic in Africa, and, and I got a community service to get young kids to school. What if all those sorters came together and expand all those programs? 
you'd have an explosion. And the successful collaborations you've had in your life, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I take it both parties had to quell their ego to focus on the mission. Well, well that's absolutely true in any kind of cultural developmental process, because that's what culture is. Culture is primarily the people's education system. The key in culture is unity. How do we work together in harmony? Unity and harmony. And that is when you establish what do we have? What is our content? I mean, what are the things we have that is useful for our development? And then you have to come together and determine what is our intent? What do we intend for the content, you know? And then you, you need a guiding tool. That's the thing we call culture. Some call it spirituality. Some call it indigenous religion. Whatever you call it, you've got to understand what in, its intent is. Is this intent to make sure you can provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for yourself and your family? And can you then bind that collectively with others so you can establish control over land, labor, and resources where you live. So then you can get control of economic, politics, and culture where you live. Those elements, I think it's about nine or 10 of them. If you can get those elements of economic, politics, and culture, land, labor, and resources, food, clothing, shelter, and safety, okay? If you could pull those pieces together in some kind of ideological, but the first thing people do is like run to white socialism. The thing that, it doesn't work for them. Show me a white socialist state where it's working. All right? Let's go back to our own way. Let's begin to look deeply into Africa. Everybody identify themselves with their people except us. You watch a TV show and you see everybody's in kind of like expressing their cultural thing. The only, we express in white culture in some form or another, you know? No, how do we unite ourselves around the, the guaranteeing of food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for ourselves and our family, getting control of land, labor, and resources, controlling economic politics and culture where we are? Malcolm described this as black nationalism. You don't have to use a label for it. Just do it. Find out how to best do it. And it has to start with, you can't say you can do your own thing and then have unity. You can't do that. That don't work. I can let you do your thing and you do your thing. That's disunity. And we're the only community that really talk about that, let everybody do their own thing. So you got the Muslim in that corner, the, the Baptist in this corner, the Jehovah's Witness in this corner, and Seventh-day Adventists in this corner, and Africa ain't nowhere in the house and you're talking about you're black. Yeah. But, you know, like, really, how can you say you respect Africa, but there's nothing in your life African guiding you? The, at your core, the history of Africa and African peoples, wherever they've gone in the world, should be what's guiding you. That determines who your friends are and who your enemies are. History will tell you the story. It'll erase the mystery. You won't be confused about who I should ally myself. And those people in the world you see dominating the world today is because they're not confused about who their friends are and who their enemies are. We can't even establish our fundamental identity. Oh, well, I got a little Irish blood, or I got a little British blood, or I got a little French blood. Okay, let me get the knife. Show me where the French one is and where the black one is, and we'll separate them out for you, and then you can make some choices, you know? But the fundamental is, we live in the United States of America. The fundamental is the majority of the wealth is in the hands of whites. The fundamental is where we do make our majority money in sports and in music, that is controlled fundamentally by white people. Most of our managers are white. Most of our lawyers are white. Most of our investors are white, right? So you make a billion dollars and some white person tell you where to invest it. And he don't let you invest none of it with black people. Okay. And when you look like you're getting too big for your pants, they do like they do cotton, they try to figure out how to strip you of your billion. Real or unreal. You know. And they've been doing this for centuries. We can study it over and over. 
the same group of white people have been destroying us, managing us, ripping us apart, imitating us. And if we dare call their name, they accuse us of being anti this or anti that. Why are white people so intimidated and threatened by black men despite their claims that black men are inferior to them and incapable of the most basic tasks? Well, that's an easy answer to that question. They know black men are inferior, I mean, are superior to them. Put us on any playing field, be it physics or football, and we will win. Give us the same opportunities, and we will win. Because we come from a history of not trying to destroy and dominate the world. And you come from a history of trying to destroy and dominate the world. And that has become the culture of the white community. You know? So you go into your medicine, and your first open heart surgery is a black man. Your first separating of, 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 of um, Siamese twins is a black man. The creator that eventually produces your first artificial heart is a black man. Um, the, the, you can just go on and on. A black janitor, John Hancock, all right, teaches your best surgeon, the janitor who never went to med school. Give me a break. You got a TV set because of a black man. You got a cell phone because of a black man. Video you games. got a touchstone because of a black woman. You got the video game because of a black man. You've got the internet because of um, a, a brother from Ghana, Nigeria or Ghana, I think the brother's from. You got the, 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 um, what's the what's when we send messages on uh, the computer. Um, you know, like I'm gonna text you, uh, like um, what do you call it? email. You have the email because of a black Indian man, you, and he's just going. All of the technology that you you're using was created for your corporations by African peoples. Yeah. All of it. I don't know. As a rational thinking human being, right? Mm -hmm. If I genuinely think you're inferior, I wouldn't pay you any mind. I wouldn't have to place so right. many things or create a system to keep you out of it because right. you're not capable of anything. But I don't think people look at uh, our system from that. They don't look at white people with that level of insecurity. And at the same token, they don't look at the brilliance within themselves as black people. Well, well part of it, you know, wh white, when we say white people, there's no such thing. They're really not as aggregated as we think they are. Because you got the Italians over here, the Jews over here, Irish over here, <clears throat> the Germans over here, the Eastern European Czechs and Slavics over here. The only time we see them come together and look like there's a unified them is when they're opposing black people's progress. And then you'll see this unity among them. Um, but in, for the most part, they're competing with one another. Um, and whenever we're allowed into that competition, everybody seems to lose. And so the thing is, don't let us in the competition. And the excuse is because we're not capable. Well, you're never going to know my capability if you don't give me access to show my capability. But that has been the history of our relationship to the European male, particularly. He's inferior. Um, he's insecure. That's what all this lynching of black people saying they're having sex with white, white women. Um, I haven't had the white women complain at all. They ain't been lynching nobody. It's only white men. So <laughs> they need to get to the bottom of that and find out what that's all about. But it's the thing is that give us the opportunity to compete on the level field. Whenever that has happened, we've done extraordinarily well. In the Second World War, they said, oh, we couldn't be pilots. They didn't want black men to be pilots. Eleanor Roosevelt said, OK, let's make a try working with um, Mary McLeod Bethune. And they set up the Tuskegee Airmen program at Tuskegee. No Air Force unit in the history of American aviation militarily has ever accomplished what those men accomplished. Nobody. But nobody talks about it. And the people you say can't fly a plane, you train them, send them over to Italy and Germany, and they don't lose a single bomber in the totality of the involvement in the war. Every bomber that they take out, they bring them all back home? And you were losing them all along the way with the best of your superior?
crap. But who talks about them? You know? Um, we need to just study history to learn the mystery, um, which is mostly the lies that white males have written or told in order to hold themselves up without earning the right to be held up. You know? And it's not just in America to do the same thing throughout the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, the same behavior. It's just that here we've been fighting them straight up and toe to toe. You gotta realize, ain't nobody took on white supremacy like black Americans. We ain't got no army, all right? We're in the midst of their houses. And we could have been brutal, we could have poisoned the foods, we would have cooked. We could have put a lot of people to sleep in one night in America with just dinner. But that, we're not animals, we don't work at that level. You know, we're not that inhuman, even against an enemy that practices genocide. You know, they never think of that. Even today, you go through corporate America, on every level, there's black folks. On every level. Maybe you won't see me as the CEO, but just drop down one notch and see who's running corporate America. They're still going to utilize your brain power. Absolutely. They're not going to give you the full Absolutely. Uh, compensation, but they're going to utilize your brain power. Absolutely. And, and this, this, this inferiority of white males have dominated the social ecology of America, you know? And, and it, we've got more CEOs in the penitentiary because white males are afraid to give them an opportunity to challenge them in the system. So you criminalize them as a teenager and you throw them in jail and we learn 40 years later he didn't commit the crime, but he's already served 40 years. You know, we just saw, I think, a basketball player's father come home after 30 years of being in prison for a crime he didn't commit. The boy hadn't seen his father since he was a baby. Just a few days ago, I forgot his name. So, but that's just one of tens of thousands of young men that's in the penal system that should have never been there. But because of your arrogance and your false notion of superiority, you bring a child into court, have no money to get a lawyer, you don't give them a real due process. You get 90% of them to plead guilty to a felony, and then you lock them in your system forever. Now, please, we have previous guests speak on this, but can you speak about it? People don't understand the court system, that majority of these cases are plea deals. Yeah. They don't go to court. Right. The court system in America is so pathetic and it's because they don't want to give access to black people, really. Give us access and we can build a court system that you can attend to the issues. So the majority of the young people who are majority black and brown people who are getting arrested on these minor felony charges and misdemeanor charges, they never go to court. They plea bargain them. But they always plea bargain them with at least a B felony so that you can lock them into a system so now you can't get a job, you can't get into public housing, even though you didn't go to prison. You can't get government funding to go to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then now you can't get employment because I see that on your record, I'm not gonna hire you, all right? I won't rent you apart an apartment because of this. And yet they ask for, well, where do that person then go? Lock them out of society. You lock them out of society and you track them into the prison that provides millions if not billions of dollars worth of salary for white males pr primarily and consistently keep those beds filled yes and so we have to understand that the prison system in america and it's just like the 13th amendment says slavery is abolished except if you're convicted of a felony and so every black man that's convicted of a felony is enslaved in america according to the constitution of the united states i want to talk about the columbia music study right Mm -hmm. and what you refer to as the draconian music industry that directs the course of our culture. Mm -hmm. Please explain to our viewers what, it, what, what was the Columbia Music Study? Well, I forgot the year. And I learned about this from my brother James and Tume, God bless his soul now, that there was a point Columbia Records, it's called the Columbia Study, but it was done at Harvard University. Columbia Records, commissioned Harvard University to do a study 
to explain to them, because what was going on in the industry, they were tying these black people to contracts for 25 and 30 years, 50 years, and stealing all of the people's money. It was ending up in all kinds of conflicts. Um, people, that's a lot of people turned to drugs. A lot of black musicians, male and female, was impoverished after making millions of dollars, which was stolen oh, by. Hold on. You said a 25-year contract? Yeah, some longer. That's crazy, man. Okay. Sorry about that. And, and, but this was usually done to some teenager who didn't know anything about law stuff. And when the people began to look for their money, they said, oh, well, you know, that airplane, you had to pay for that, you had to pay for the car, you had to pay for this one, you had to pay for this. So you don't really have no money. But me, the agent now, and the lawyer, we made plenty of money. We made millions off of you. But you have nothing to show. So people began to fight back. One of the sisters that go on sound, we don't hear much about, if anything. And I used to love her when I was a child. She used to be on the bubblegum card, the most beautiful black woman in the world. Her name was Ruth Brown. And they pushed out of the industry because she started fighting for the black uh, performers to get their, um, what do you call it, the, the monies when you sell, sell a record, royalties. your royalties. And she, fought, she finally won years, years later the cases. But that kind of struggle was going on. So Col Columbia um, Records asked Harvard University to do a study to tell them how to best run the industry without cr having to do these long contracts and having to create these conflicts and so forth. And the study concluded that if you control the distribution of the music, you, you can give them their masters, you can give them uh, their royalties, but control the distribution, you control the artists. All right. And so that's what the industry does today. That if you don't do what we tell you, your stuff don't leave the studios. It don't leave the warehouse. And I remember when they did this to Black Street, when, uh, Teddy Riley, when Teddy and them was, you know, they were rhythm and blues, and they were told that they had to do rap. And when they said, no, 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 we don't do rap, that ain't nothing, we, we're rhythm and blues soul singers. And they were told by Interscope Records that if you don't do this, your stuff will never leave the warehouse. And they did that to a lot of artists. Artists are now breaking free from all of this. They're beginning through the last 10 years to understand this, and, but they're now coming to the table making better contracts. Um, we see it with the Jay-Z, he was able to break away and without getting absorbed by the system. Some of the others we think got away, didn't get away, they got absorbed by the system, so they look like big black men, but they're weak little white men in black face. I give Jay-Z credit, him and his wife, because they, they really did create a black enterprise. Sam Cooke created a black enterprise, but they murdered him. Um, this was going back to the day, um, Nat King Cole, uh, had to create his record company in Mexico. He couldn't create a record company in America. All right. James Brown created his record company in three different places, Detroit, California, and Georgia. And when he amalgamated and pulled it together, and his son, who had just gotten a master's degree, became the president of the company, he had a mysterious car accident on the Jersey Turnpike where he got killed when a tractor-trailer truck ran over his car. Son. James Brown's son. So, we really need to study the history of black people fighting against the conclusions of, of um, the Columbia Records study that Harvard University did for them on how to control the music industry. So the trillions of dollars that was made in the music industry over the last 50 years went primarily to white people and not the black artists who was making all that beautiful music. All right, and, and the second part here too where you speak about um, <laughs> Uh, where you speak about the music industry directing the course of our culture. Can you talk about that? Well, you know, culture is driven by the tools of culture. Music is a tool of culture. It carries information. It carries this image. It influences emotion. All right? It tells stories. It creates metaphor. It creates folklore. All of this comes from music. And so music is one of the tools that educate more than any other tool in a culture, a society. And so whoever determines the tenor of a music, meaning the lyrics, 
um, the ethical, moral content. Whoever determines that controls the socialization process of the population. Socialization, how you get your values, your interests, and your principles. And so that's why the people are always trying to dominate our music. For the, an African people, music is essential to us having a partnership with the rest of nature. It's all about rhythm and vibration and being in tune. So if you control my rhythm, my vibration, my attunement, then you can now send any negative message on those streams that you want to influence on how I see reality and how I act that out. And we see it in our youth, especially with the new technology of the telephone and, and, and the hip hop and the, the, we have no control over their access to the worst or the best. Somebody else does, and it's a very deliberate doing. And so what we have to wake up and understand that culture isn't just listening to music. You're absorbing the ideas of the music. Okay? You're being influenced by the pictures painted by the music. Okay? So if somebody can control the pictures and the images and the ideas of the music that you're enjoying and absorbing with your African rhythm, they're controlling your mind to a great degree. Scary when you know the reality, but so many people say, oh, I just listened to it. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't influence yeah, me. Well, that, that's not real. Yeah. That's like somebody saying, I drink, but I'm not an alcoholic. I, but if I get drunk every night, it's just because I drink to kind of relax. Uh, you know, that's not being real, you know. Um, I smoke cigarettes. I know it's going to kill me. I know I'm going to get lung cancer, but it helps me to relax at the end of the day. Well, you smoke during the lunchtime, you smoke during breakfast, you smoke during your break. <laughs> you know, you're addicted to something, and it is causing a harm in you. Well, you can be addicted to music. You can be addicted to a beat. You can be addicted to a set of rhythmic patterns. And with those, information is sent to your brain, which is then sent to the rest of your being. And that information influences how you see everything else in the world and how you view everything else in the world. Please tell our viewers about the importance of the Iroquois Confederacy, Great Law of Peace, and its influence on the creation of the United States Constitution. I heard, I don't know, I'm not a scholar in the Iroquois Confederation. Um, I think it's overblown, its influence is overblown. Um, the Iroquois Confederation had just began to put themselves together at the same time that the United States was putting itself together. Um, this, this, you know, White people have a thing, and we'll never let nothing go to black if we can find something to brown or yellow to put it to, if it ain't white, right? And this thing about the Iroquois Confederation, the Iroquois Confederation, I've seen some stuff on TV, and it's bogus, it's joke, you know? All of a sudden, this, most white folks had never even heard of the Iroquois who was in there trying to create this constitution. 99% of them have never heard of them, and the few that did probably could care less. If anybody knew anything about their confederation, they said, um, what's his name, um, Benjamin Franklin or somebody knew something about it. I think it's mostly bogus. I don't even play in that game. You know, most of the people who were in that, uh, if not most, the significant of the leadership, though they were a bunch of slave-owning, genociding criminals um, who were creating the Constitution and the Document of Independence, they were all Freemasons, okay? And everything that people are attributing to the Iroquois Confederation is a part of the Freemasonic structuring of social organization. And that comes right up out of Africa. So if you don't want to trace it back to Africa, you can give it to the Iroquois. The Iroquois couldn't keep themselves organized. No disrespect. I believe the truth is the truth, you know? Uh, this great Iroquois Confederation, where, where was it? What did it do? And when did white people learn about it? 
Where did they have? Where did they write this stuff down? All of a sudden, they're going to create this now because if you give it to what it belongs to, it'll lead back to where it came from. All right. I'm a Freemason. I'm a Prince Hall Freemason. I have no problem with that. I've studied it. I know how Freemasonry work. I've studied Freemasonry, Rosicrucian, a nice of pithiest odd fellows. They're all coming from the same source. But they're all about organizing society, how to structure. They're all about democracy, what we, the word we use now. So they didn't have to go to no Iroquois to find none of that. The, 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 the myth, you can call it Congress if you want to, is nothing but the House of Lords and the House of Commons. All right? They already had that in England. All right? You understand? Congress is the House of Commons. The Senate is the House of Lords. Stop playing. The presidency is the, the monarchy, except your powers are limited. Stop playing, you know. Tell people the truth. So much America, Confederacy. Stop the stupid, you know. <laughs> I mean, like sometimes it's just like, I mean, not taking nothing from my Iroquois brothers, but Iroquois system is no different than any other native system. It's all based on communal, collective, and cooperative structuring and social order. But. You want to play with people's minds. No, this is a replica of England. All right? This is a replica of England. And where the presidency sits as a management for the corporate America, corporate America is the monarchy. It's not one person. It's the corporate banking structure. But presidents, they're nothing but managers. Doesn't matter whether you're Republican, or whether you are um, Democrat, you're managing somebody else's system. You can't come up with nothing that they want you to. And if you come up with it, you'll end up like John Kennedy, very dead, or Abe Lincoln, very dead, or Garfield, very dead, or Harrison, very dead. Do you know America have had more assassination of presidents than any other country in the modern world? Because nobody thinks of it. We think of John Kennedy's death. But Lincoln got assassinated, Garfield got assassinated, Harrison got assassinated. Then what, did Arthur get assassinated or Smith? A whole, but six or seven of them. Yeah, but we never think of it, never think of it, because nobody talks about them. All right? But this is the House of Lords and the House of Commons. That's all it is. They just got different buildings in England, they're in the same building. Here they got different buildings, same, same, same structure. You know, that's why the numbers are what they are. You notice the number in the House of Lords don't change. All right. But they got the real power. Congress can set all the stuff up they want. If the Senate don't pass it, it, it's nothing. Everybody that we know that's the Senate is at least a millionaire. I want to talk about the brilliance of Dr. Amos Wilson. Amos, beautiful brother. Um, King. When did you meet him? I don't even know. I think I met Amos sometime when I came back from Boston, sometime in the early 80s. I couldn't tell you exactly when I met Amos, but I know it's in the early 80s. Because uh, I'd come back, I'd been in Boston. I might have met him before I went to Boston, but I went to live in Boston. I lived back and forth in Boston for years. But in 75, I moved up there with the intent of staying there. And I was there for five years, then I came back. And I got very embedded in Harlem politics, Harlem educational system. And that's during the period of time I met um, Amos. I had known Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark prior to that time. I had worked with them. I had worked with Dr. Jeffries prior to that time. <clears throat> and I might have met Asa, me and Amos, but we got closer when I got back here in, the, in 1980. Um, Amos was, I used to call him an uh, African-American culturalist par excellence and an African perfectionist. Um, he psychologically understood white people, black people, and the system. See, the system has its own psychology. It's, it's not just benign. It, it, it evokes 
And so he understood systemically how America worked and how it affected the psychology of black people. I remember his first book, and I remember where I first met him, um, 1980, in the office of Joseph Mack on 7th Avenue. He had just finished his book, The, the Development of Psychology of the Black Child. And we met in Joe's office, which was across the street from my kids' elementary school. Um, Joe Mack is an attorney, a civil rights attorney, an activist attorney in the community at the time. And um, reading that book, The Development of Psychology of the Black Child, just blew me away. And um, sitting and talking to Amos, because he had, Joe gave him a space in his law office for his office. Um, and he was just totally dedicated to trying to make us understand psychologically how we were being affected by slavery, by the post-slavery era, by the educational structure, by the political structure. He said that all these things are psychologically injuring us or debilitating us or disabling us but you have to understand how to dismantle them in your mind to see the damage that they're doing. You know, he did that better than anybody else, you know. You've been around a lot of brilliant brothers, right? Including I, I've been very, very, very <laughs> blessed. Um, I knew everybody. Is he, um, is he up there in regards to one of the most brilliant people you ever met? Who, Amos? Yeah. yeah Amos was a god. Yeah. Um, Blueprint for Black Power, which is his last piece, which was finished after his death. But I like Developmental Psychology of the Black Child. Um, everything Amos Wilson ever wrote was to dissect America's psychological influence on black people. N no one comes really close to him except maybe Wade Nobles and Naim Akbar. But I put Amos above both of them in terms of analyzing the psychological influence, the psychological damaging the psychological abuse of black people by the system and the deliberacy of them, the structured, organized manner in which that psychology was used against us. And uh, uh, Dr. Wilson and Khalid Muhammad both died of aneurysms? I know Khalid died from an aneurysm. I weren't quite sure. I know um, Amos had high blood pressure. Collett had high blood pressure. Most people didn't know that. I knew that. Um, Amos also had an extreme case of asthma. Extreme case of asthma. Um, whatever else was going on, I didn't know. But I know him, Collett, and myself, we were marching, and it was raining like really bad that day to support the merchants on 125th Street who had been removed by the police that morning. I think Reverend Shopton was with us too. He came up later. Um, and then, I mean, we were out there marching in the rain and everybody got soaked. And by the time we agreed who would get arrested and who would go and try to get them out, um, Reverend Shopton was arrested. I think Collard was arrested. Me and Amos, we didn't get arrested because I didn't play that getting arrested thing. Um, and we got to the precinct, and by then Amos was shaking. And I remember I got a couple of brothers, put him in a cab and take him home. That's the last time I saw him, I never saw him. He got sick after that, and I never saw him again. Um, so I don't know whether it was an aneurysm that finally took him out or whether it was the, the, as, the chronic asthma um, or whether it's a high blood pressure or a combination of all of those things. Those things also affect your kidneys and so forth. On the college case, I knew it was an aneurysm um, because I was the first one that got called to, to, that he was dead and to keep the death a secret until things could get organized. Um, that was his wife and his um, son and Malik Zulu Shabazz um, and Brother Hakeem. Um, I made the announcement in New York of his death in front of the Apollo, me and Bubadika Sunny Carson and the December 12th movement. Um, but 
and Colin and I had been together that Saturday night. He died that Tuesday. He was speaking at Harriet Tubman School. I was speaking at First World. So we met early in the evening because we knew we were speaking at virtually the same time. And uh, later that night, about 11, him and Hakeem Hashim called me at my house. And we talked for about an hour. And he said he was going down to Philly to, there was a basketball championship or something. And then he started joking about this Philly steak he was going to eat. And I told him, boy, you don't need to be eating no damn Philly steak. And, and uh, that's the last conversation we had until I got that phone call on Tuesday morning. Um, <clears throat> he was sick. He was on the high blood pressure medicine, that beta blocker. And he took it when he wanted to and took it when he didn't want to, he didn't. But with beta blocker, you can't do that. You got to be consistent. You got to take it on time, the same time, etc. Well, he would take it when he was feeling good. He stopped taking it, and then when he got to feeling bad, he'd take it again. But that would kill you, and, and it did exactly what it would do. It would lead to an aneurysm. Um, so, great soldier, extraordinary soldier. Loved him forever. We so sometimes called me at seven o'clock in the morning every morning just to discuss stuff, or he'd just show up in town and show up at my house at 12, 1 o'clock at night. Um, always had ideas in his head, what he wanted to do for black people, how he wanted to rebuild that new Black Panther Party. Um, I remember the last big discussion we had about that, and I said, take him under the uniforms. Don't have the uniforms. Let the dress be clandestine, you know? Um, he didn't fully agree with that, because everybody liked the symbolisms and stuff. I still feel the same way about that. Did he ever express his hurt with his uh, separation from Nation of Islam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he expressed his hurt. I was with him when he got the letter. I mean, I was with him in Baltimore. Um, me and him and Seg met Patricia, Dr. Patricia Newton. Um, and he got a letter from one of the big ministers in D.C. actually threatening him um, for harming the, the minister's program. Um, he cried like a baby, you know. Uh, he never wanted to leave the nation of Islam. He never saw himself as an enemy to the minister. He always loved the minister and followed the minister's lead. He disagreed with certain things, but almost anybody disagreed with your leader or something. But the night he was in Jersey, we were at Cade College. I was with him that night also. Um, with Jeff Carroll and some of the others, the student union had invited us to speak. And we were inside. Jeff came in and said this little white reporter wanted to come in. Normally we didn't let white people into our meetings. And I said no. Khalid said yes. And he just insists. And we get up and go walk outside. That was the source of the problem then, that reporter? Right, that right. reporter. He got to the door and I told him, don't let the dude in here. He said, no, you know, bring him in. He brought a dude in and said, sit him right in front of him. And that's the dude that wrote the article where he said he looked under the Pope dress and yada, that the minister kicked him out of the nation for that article. You know, and it was that reporter that we told him, don't bring that Negro in here. He was a white boy, little Jewish guy. You know, he came to do what he came to do. It was like a, almost like a Malcolm X 2.0 in a sense because uh, I saw speeches where he said he was reaching out to Farrakhan, but he wasn't getting a response. Yeah, I don't know all of the details of their relationship because I didn't really know their relationship like that. I mean, I know a lot more than most people because Khalid told me a lot about from the very beginning when he was walking around with the Koran and cut out with the nine millimeter in the Koran. Um, when the minister had nobody to stand with him but him, he was the one standing with him alone. I don't know what their relationship was. I know he was the one that brought me and the minister together, you know to break bread and to move away from any hostility between Malcolm's community and his. Um, I knew he loved the minister. I knew he, you know, adored uh, the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But when you're out in the political world, the guy in the field is going to see something the people in, in the house don't see. And that's usually where the class comes. You got a field soldier and he's experiencing the people one way and you're in the house and you're experiencing the people the other way. And when it's time to say what should be done, there's usually a conflict. And I think that's where the conflict came, uh, you know. 
I was with him when he founded the new Black Panther Party. When he got shot in L.A., I, I flew out to L.A. They wanted Dr. Jeffries to come and tell him no. We won't send Dr. Jeffries. I'll come myself. Um, and I took, we took him from L.A. and we went to Texas. Um, so I found myself I've been involved in a lot of stuff. That's what I'm saying, man. <laughs> a lot of people. Uh, just but look, when you had a certain space and struggle, you're you're together, you know, with certain people. All right, last figure I want to talk about before we get into healthcare, um, Dr. John Henry Clark. Mm -hmm. Right. The question I have for you is, how was this man able to acquire so much information? John was an, what's that word, adamant, avid reader. John read everything that had writing on it. Um, his house was libraries, every room, whether there was a bedroom, there was bookshelves all around, from floor to ceiling. And every room had a category. I remember on the third floor was the Islam, and I'd go there to study the Islam. Because he, I asked him, what area should I have? I told him, you got your area, Dr. J. You got his area, Dr. Ben, got his, what should be mine? And he told me to master Islam in North Africa, to study that, and he gave me access to his library. But he was close to us in black studies at City College and in the First World Alliance, and the group that I worked with called the Sons of Africa, so he was like our father. So, you know, I'd go to his house to paint, me and Reggie and the brothers. Um, I'd put up ceilings, she, you know, because I'm pretty good at doing dry board, putting up sheetrock in the bathroom and things like that, and just being able to sit with him and talk, you know, even before he became blind and after. Um, and just one thing he read, everything. He, if he wasn't given a lecture, the man was reading. He was studying um, because he loved history and he understood you had to have information and then you had to make sure you had accurate information. So that means you had to examine lots of documents, you know, and he did that. And, and he had such an extraordinary memory. But be, beyond the memory, um, what I learned from John was that he, um, they got a word for it too. Um, the people call it channel. But he could go with the ancestors. I mean, one day we were someplace and he was lecturing about Shaka, king of the Zulus. And then he says, yeah, and Shaka walked into the kitchen and he put his hands on his jaw like this and he looked at his mother. Afterwards, I said, now John, how did you know he put his hands on that table and look at it? And he just laughed. And I go, like, you know, some, and I saw him do that a number of times by different historical figures. And I suddenly realized he could move back in time. That he can actually go to that place where those ancestors were. And so I sought to try to be like that. How do I tap into the ancestors so they become my teachers? And I think John had through becoming such a learned individual, had moved beyond the realm of now into the realm of where we used to be, you know? I would like to talk about America's healthcare system and how a person's economics and zip code almost guarantee subpar healthcare. Mm -hmm. Well, you're asking for a lot on a Sunday. <laughs> America has the potential of having the greatest healthcare system in the world, but because of corporate greed and pharmaceutical manipulation, it has the worst. That the masses of people have to suffer just to get basic healthcare. And that most of the people in the healthcare industry, even those who mean well, end up, if they're able to, going to survive in that industry, they got to become pill-pushing manipulators who don't even care about the health of the person. So you walk into a doctor's office and you get an examination, the routine, you know, you, you check my blood, you do an EKG, you check my weight, etc., and then you do the basic exam, and depending on what I'm ill, you're passing me a bottle of something, the latest pharmaceutical junk 
that's been put in the marketplace because every doctor get a kickback based on the amount of prescriptions they're writing for certain medications. I mean, like, what, what's that? You know, most doctors have so many patients, they really can't deal with the health of the patient. It becomes almost like a treadmill, you know? I always, I always talk to people like, right now for my primary physician, I'm lucky if I'm in front of them for about seven min five to seven minutes, no more than that. Right. And so I'm lucky because I have a primary who I've known for 25, almost 30 years, and she's a friend. And so if she sees something wrong, she'll call me at home. Or but everybody isn't that lucky. Or if I go to see Cynthia, we may fight over what I'm doing or not doing or something, but she's not going to let me leave that office until she makes sure she doesn't check for everything. But everybody don't get a Dr. Cynthia Myers, you know. And so, but my wife is a physician and she just retired and she worked in adolescent medicine. And I saw her struggling through the years to fight as an advocate. Adolescent medicine is the children from I think 13 to 21. And, and so she had to become the advocate. She had to fight the rest of the system that she's working in for these children. And that went on until the day she was leaving. Matter of fact, people still call in the house, you know. Because the system is designed to make money. A hospital must make money. To make money, you must have patience. To have patience, you must let people be sick, <laughs> okay? I mean, for you don't make them sick, you just let them be sick. You don't heal them you maintain them. And the medical system in America is not a healing system. It's a maintenance system that's driven, the maintenance is driven by the pharmaceuticals who come up, they'll give you one drug, and then they'll give you a drug to handle the effects of that drug. You know? And the doctors, you're making money. If you don't push this stuff, then you can be in trouble and being able to find work in the industry. And I used to go, I remember, to my doctor's office, and there was always a, lot, a line of pharmaceutical salespersons sitting there with their little briefcase and stuff. And I go, like, what's that really all about? And that's a kickback system. You push our drugs and you get a certain percentage on what you are able to write prescriptions for. And regarding the effectiveness of the drugs that are side effects of the drugs on your patient. Who cares? They give you the list of it. Almost all of it will kill you just for taking it, you know. But at the end of the day, we don't have a healing system. We have a patient maintenance system that you must have patience to drive the system. You walk into an emergency room and say, I've got a, a splint in my finger. You walk back out, that's a thousand dollar bill plus. Um. Uh, I, I know you currently have some experiences with the healthcare industry. Can you share your personal experiences with the healthcare industry? Yeah, I talk, I talk to people about it. I, I, like I said, I've been very lucky. I've had some good people. I've had some bad people. Um, but because I've been involved with the system, I have an enlarged prostate. I just got through with a procedure called embolism catheterization, very dangerous procedure, where they go through my wrist with a, um, with a catheter, and they go all the way down to my groin with this wire thing. And <clears throat> they catheterize some of the blood vessels to cut off the oxygen flow to the prostate to then force it to shrink. During the process of the 35 years or so, I've struggled with this. You know, I've like bled monthly, two, three times a month. I may have a bleeding episode. I may have blood cloth in my bladder for months at a time. Um, I'd have to go to the hospital occasionally to be catheterized so that I could drain my bladder and try to wash some of the blood out. Sometimes I've been hospitalized with big jugs of water just washing me out. Through the years, I've given lectures. People are known I'm wearing a bag 
strapped to my leg, but I either have an African robe or baggy pants. So nobody knows that I'm going through this. Um, because the industry, men were dying very young, usually in their late 60s on average. So there was no money to be made off of fixing the prostate. That's a cold statement, man. Huh? That's a cold statement. It's yeah. a real statement. And so after 35 years of back and forth, I said, that's real. I went to like about five or six different urologists. All of them are fairly good people, mean well. And most of them are honest enough to tell me what they weren't able to do. They just didn't have the technology and the knowledge. In the last 10 years, though, the technology has exploded. So you're uh, telling me men, you say you've been doing this with th for th over three decades? Mm-hmm. I know everybody thought they saw this handsome bravado brought out there speaking and stuff. And they go like, yeah, but sisters, I couldn't function very well because this thing had been on me. Um, in ways you can't even imagine. Imagine just going to the bathroom and I think I'm urinating and all I get is red. <laughs> and I'm standing there going, oh God, not again. You know, um, prostate is supposed to be as big as a, a, a walnut. Mine was bigger than a grapefruit. And it just crushed my bladder and that causing capillary breakage. And that's what caused the bleeding. And then that could block up your your um, urethria and then you couldn't urinate and that's a terrible situation because that backs up to your kidney and that could poison you and kill you. And so I'd have to go to the hospital and have catheters placed in me to drain me out to get the blood clots out. Sometimes it'd be so bad I had to do like three, four catheters in three or four days because it got clogged up with blood clot. So yeah, I went through that for 35 years and, and, and managed myself. I had some good urologists who helped me along the way. And we had, they had a couple of medicine, but neither worked very well. They've got a couple of new drugs now, and they seem to work much better. But they couldn't do me any good because mine was so big, right? And so the procedure I, I'm just coming from under three weeks ago seemed to, after almost 40 years, work, right? It has shrunk. I could feel the shrinking. Is there any less pain now? Yeah, hardly no pain. The only pain I have now is in my hand where they went in through my artery. Because the artery, I didn't realize, have both muscles and nerves in there, unlike the vein. The vein is just like a tube, but the artery is different. Um, and I'd been talking for years to people where I could about the prostate and my situation. But I plan to do a lot more because I realized when I was going through this, I'm calling all of my friends. And about eight out of 10 had had some kind of surgical procedure for either prostate cancer or enlarged can prostate cancer or an enlarged prostate. And none of them was talking about it. And so I told them, I'm going to bring them all on a show. They got to come on somebody's platform with me. And we're going to talk to young people about what are the signs, what do you need to look for, um, um, what kind of literature you need to read to get a good sense of understanding how your body works, what kind of diet you need to lean towards and those kinds of things. Can you just tell our viewers briefly the things they should be looking for, looking out for the prostate? Right, the, the, the first thing is when you go to urinate and you have to wait. And then the stream is poor. Instead of having a nice flush, you're getting a, almost a dribble, you know. And then when you finish, you're not fully emptying, your bladder hasn't been fully emptied. And then within an hour or so, you got to go back to the bathroom again. And so that increases in all kinds of ways, especially in the evening when you go to sleep, you end up having to wake up two, three times a night to go to the bathroom. And each time again, you're not emptying out the bladder enough. And then you have other stuff, you get constipated, you know, because all of the, your, 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 um, all of those, instruments are in the same place. Your urethra, your, um, uh, what do you call it, your rectum, your, your bladder, every, every, your, a man don't have the same space that a woman have in this area. So we have a small space. And so everything is kind of touching on each other. So you get constipated, you find I can't go to the bathroom, I want to pee really bad, but I can't go. Cause I'm constipated and then you're just getting a little bit out of the time and then you got to go back in 15 minutes 
When those things start happening, you need to go to your doctor and really, you know, start with a sonogram or ultrasound, see whether it's an enlargement. Um, they have another thing, you have asked for a PSA test. Your PSA should be around between one and three. That's called, um, PSA is a prostate a serum antigen. And uh, they measure that. That's not 100%, but that's the best deal in town. And if that starts rising, you need to question what's going on with your prostate because it could be cancerous or it could be enlargement. <coughs> but it usually hits you in your 40s, but we don't pay attention to it until our 60s. Um, same thing happened. You may want to get an erection. You may get a, get a good erection, but you find that you will ejaculate very quickly and you don't even get to enjoy the sex process. That's another big signal that you need to go and check your prostate because it sits right under the bladder and it surrounds the, the penis. And so once that begins to swell, it puts pressure on everything in that sector, um, your rectum, your urethra, your bladder, and it, everything affects one another. So constipation could throw you into a trouble um, drinking too much. Um, I just like to drink beer. I don't do it anymore. Um, you know, beer, you do like two, three bottles and you realize, oh, God, I gotta go to the bathroom. And then nothing comes out. Then you're just leaning on the wall, you're dancing around the toilet stool, you're doing all kinds of things, trying to get that water out. Any of those kinds of things begin, to, and it develops slowly. When you see the signs of any of them, go to your doctor. Say, I wanna have my prostate check, you know. Ultrasound is one of the best ways to see what it is in terms of size. If you have any other kinds of concern, then biopsy, you know, if your PSA gets too high. I mean, my PSA was up to like 60, 70. You're supposed so to be going. One in three? Huh? What, what, you supposed to it should be one in three. Yeah, Mine is up to 60, yeah. So that means you're going, but that's because mom is so big. Um, but the worst thing is the, the backup, when you get the backup in your bladder, that can back up into your kidneys and the bacteria could cause trauma and cause you to lose the kidney or end up being on dialysis because you poisoned your kidney with the waste back up from the bladder because you haven't been able to empty out fully as you're going to the bathroom. And all of those things, the bleeding comes, I had a lot of bleeding, mom was so big, it pressed up against the bladder and it broke capillaries in the bladder and that blood bled into the urine. So you go to the bathroom and you get a bowl full of bread and you go like, oh my God, I'm dying. And uh, it wasn't all blood, but the urine had been turned to red. In some cases you get a lot of blood, but blood is heavier than urine, so it sinks down and become a very, very clump of, uh, what do you call it, blood cloth. And you go to the bathroom one day and blood clots as big as your fingers squeezing out of you. And then, so all of those things, if you don't have help, you're gonna go through. I didn't have help. Even I was going to doctors, they didn't know what to do. I mean, they were more frustrated than me until recent years where they began to come up with new treatments. And as men began to live now older into their 75, 80s, it, 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 it's, it's um, profitable for the industry to invest in cures and treatments for the um, prostate. Before, a man wasn't living long enough for them to make enough money off of the prostate. Let me just be frank. Malcolm X demonstrated a, a reformation that most people, uh, uh, let, me, let me just read the question, hold on. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Throughout history, Malcolm X has been praised for many things, right? Though I mm -hmm. don't see people praising him for his ability to change. Do you believe everyone has the capability of reforming themselves the way Malcolm X did? Mm -hmm. I believe everyone has the capability of changing and transforming themselves the way Malcolm X did. But you have to do some of the things Malcolm X did. He studied. Again, like John Clark, he was an avid reader. The man read everything. And not just black literature, you read world literature. Not just politics, but economics, sociology. He read everything. And so he was well informed. 
and traveling, he, even just traveling around America, traveling from community to community, you begin to learn from the crisis and the issues in those communities and the kind of conflict resolutions that these people are trying to bring forth to solve their problems. And you can bring them forth to help you with your problems. And so Malcolm went through, if, if Malcolm represented anything, he represents transformation, right? Transformation as a result of change and change as a result of greater enlightenment through study and learning. Professor Smalls, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, <laughs> for the sir. Class. I'm glad we finally got together. We've been <laughs> trying before I went in the hospital, so Seriously. you saw me go through all of this Seriously. medical thing in the last two months, and um, but I'm feeling like really good. Um, my body is bouncing back. I grew my hair. You know, I was bald headed for a while because I was challenging myself with the graying and the losing of the hair both in the pubic area and here, and, and I saw all the gray went away. <laughs> no, as your he, body heals, it, the hair is a good barometer of how you're healing. So, so let me just let my hair grow for a while. And a lot of the gray went away. I mean, I know I'm going to get gray. I'm 78 years old, right? Um, but I can see the, health, the hair forecast what's going on with your health. It forecasts what's going on with your health. And I thought, that's interesting, so I'm going to try it on myself. I'll just work that out for myself and see what's happening.